I'm not sure what to, to say after that, except that um, uh, I do come from the far south, and in those days it was just cows and sheep, uh, and the deer were somewhere out there, uh, and people went off with guns and shot them. And, uh, um, uh, and in 1974, uh, I was actually in London in 1974. It's a sli slight recalculation. I started in 1969, and I took four years with the International Wool Secretariat in London. I learned a, an industry all the way from the sheep to the shop. It was really very useful. Um, I have to say that, um, uh, and this is not just because you're here, that uh, venison is my preferred uh, meat, uh, except for one thing, and that's raw snails. And if you've ever had a raw snail, it requires considerable effort, shall I say. I'm joking here. Um, I'll say, uh, the, uh, I've done some notes which uh, Dan might want to send to you. I'm not going to read all the way through them. They'll take me around about an hour. Um, but just to uh, underline that we are in an unusual decade and we're about to go into, I think, an even more unusual decade, uh, and for a number of reasons, and that is globalisation is changing. It's not the old shifting thing around the world in global value chains, increasingly its networks and increasingly it's how software operates. It's a digital economy and global finance is growing still like that and global finance drives a great deal of the global economy. And that global economy continues to rebalance, and you well know that, that uh, uh, China, uh, China's rise is really important, but it's not just China's rise. There's a lot of other rebalancing uh, going on, and that is contributing to uh, geopolitical instability. Uh, and that's uh, in developed economies. Um, that has uh, uh, shown up in populism of various sorts. And that all goes all the way from Trump across to Brexit, across to uh, various parties in the uh, in France. And that, the populism is distinguished not particularly by whether you're left or right; it's by what you're against. And uh, um, the uh, 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 and a populist leader is defines himself or herself. Some there are some hers um, against uh, by what they're against, and they bring people in behind them. Though. Important thing to remember about populism, it's almost always uh, destructive one way or another, especially for the people who vote the populists in. The very worst example of that, and I'm not suggesting we're heading for that, is uh, Nazism in the, in the 30s. Uh, and that's uh, the alternative uh, to populism is um, macro personalities. That's a lovely word. It's such an awful word. I love to use it. It's um, Justin Trudeau and, or Justin Trudeau, depending which language you want to talk in, in, in Canada, and Emmanuel Macron in France, and Jacinda Ardern here. These are people who somehow float above politics. And to a fair extent, John Key did that as well, um, uh, before Jacinda did. Um, and the next is that under 30s are increasingly divorcing themselves from the old system or up in the northern, I'm talking northern liberal democracies. And you get this word socialism reappearing in the dialogue. What they really mean is some new form or some old form, depending whether you're what age you are, but the under 30s weren't looking for a new form of, of social democracy uh, um, that uh, basically is not very friendly towards uh, capitalism as we've known it. And that's all accompanied by first principles uh, re-evaluation of the economic orthodoxies of the 1980s. That's been going on for quite some time, but it's become particularly noticeable. I subscribe to the Financial Times, the debate in the Financial Times, and now even The Economist in the last 18 months or two years, uh, both firmly wedded to the orthodoxies of the 80s, are running a lot of material which asks uh, questions about that. And there's a quite a number of questions. One is on whether GDP really measures what's going on in the economy. A mm. uh, second is the central bank's obsession with inflation, um, trying to get inflation up. Uh, third is what globalisation, I mentioned before, what it is now. Uh, purpose and the conduct of corporations. You know, what do they stand for? Uh, they would say shareholder value. But who are the shareholders? Well, they're mainly now... Uh, investment banks and hedge funds and so on, who have very short-term motives, not longer-term ones, certainly not the word sustainability doesn't come in there. 
Uh, and then there's the regulator's capacity to, ex to respond to, these, to new technologies quickly uh, and relevantly. And I think it's taking our regulators a long time to figure they have to be a lot faster, even if they make mistakes, because they sit around for two years wondering what they might think about possibly doing and then taking another two years uh, that whatever damage there is will have been done. And I want to end, end on that big picture with uh, the fact that there is a real possibility of another what I call disjunctive shock. And the biggest one in the last 100 years is the one we've just finished commemorating the First World War, which brought down uh, four empires and mortally wounded a fifth the British one. Uh, and uh, um, and the, the late, latest big one was the 2008 GFC. I read a lot of commentary in these sober journals, not the wild sort of left financial times, uh, people worrying about what the next shock will be, when it will come and what will trigger it. And one of the triggers might be that debt has been doing that for now about 20 years, global debt. And there's a point at which debt can't go on doing that, divorcing itself from GDP, which is doing that, if you follow what I'm trying to say. So it might come out of the financial system, uh, it might uh, come out of the environmental system, and that's the other a uh, big challenge is climate change, but environment generally, and I think water is more proximate. I think of India, where uh, at some point those uh, bores will go down through the bottom of the aquifers and there won't be any water coming up, and at the same time, if uh, monsoons are disturbed, uh, that could lead to quite serious uh, uh, conflict within nations and between nations. Uh, so that's my general starting point, and you'll understand how, co how happy and optimistic that all looks. <laughs> There is good reason to be optimi optimistic, and I can go on, on about um, the op opportunities in some of the uh, technology, for instance, um, uh, both digital technology, what artificial uh, intelligence can do, what uh, gene editing can do, and I think that's an un it's unfortunate that we've got a government at the moment where one bit of it is just opposed full stop to gene editing. The, p the potential for good is quite considerable. The potential for bad is as well in the hands of, say, a dictator. Um, artificial protein is one that you obviously spend some time thinking about. Um, it's in its early stages, I think. Uh, and uh, so if we're just talking about the next five years, it's probably not a significant issue. But I would, if I was looking out 10 years, um, I would say it could become uh, quite an issue. And I know that um, uh, Dan disagrees with me on that. I've mentioned the planetary limits. I mentioned water. I mentioned pollution. I mentioned climate change, uh, pandemics. Uh, and now that uh, we've got bacteria that are uh, resistant to antibiotics and new strains of viruses. Uh, and then finally, generational change. And I'll come back to that because I think it's really quite important here. Those, uh, those who were born uh, after 1945 or a couple of years before, uh, who are known as the baby boomers, um, they're going out of uh, fashion. Uh, and I think, I think about time. <laughs> Which is, which is why um, I'm about to sort of head off as well. There's, there's someone who's uh, six months younger than me who uh, goes under a certain title with deputy in front of it at the moment. Uh, and uh, I think we, the, there was a big change in, that, um, uh, in the 9, 2017 election, uh, a marked change in, in the generation, uh, generational content of parliament. Uh, and uh, it's, if you want a... Uh, uh, a, um, uh, if you want a parallel, it's the, the big change in the 1984 election when the baby boomers took charge. And you'd all like a nice, calm period like that, wouldn't you, again? Where nothing much is done and you get plenty of warning. <coughs> <coughs> sorry, sorry, if I'm going to have a... <coughs> a glass. <coughs> <coughs> um, <coughs> <coughs> well, those who are um, under um, under 40 went from 13 just before the election, this is at, as a, at election time, to 25 after the election. Uh, and if you add in the 40s to 45s, you get 37% of, of parliament. Two more have come in since, Nicola Willis and uh, Agnes uh, um, Loheni. Uh, and uh, that uh, you can be sure it'll be over 40% in the next election and probably over 50% in the, in the election after that. So that's a really significant change because these people grew up 
in a time when they thought differently, the experiences were different, the way in which their way, view of the world changed, uh, was, uh, way in which they viewed the world uh, changed and was different from the uh, baby boomers before them. There's another generation coming up behind, which I'll talk about uh, later. Uh, New Zealand has been, and I talked about this outside world where there's a lot of turmoil, and I could go on and on about it. Um, quite a lot of what I put in my, my last book, which is called Unquiet Time, uh, published a couple of years ago. Um, we, we're in a little bubble. Things are going pretty much sort of all right here. National Party, the centre-right, Labour Party, the centre-left, pretty much still in charge. You go to anywhere in Europe and the centre-right and the centre-left are... <coughs> you go to, to Britain where they seem to be still in charge, Labour and Tories, but actually there's three Tory parties and three Labour parties. You go to the United States and you try to understand what the Democrat Party might or might not be and then you try and understand why the uh, Republicans think conservatism is supporting Trump. Um, so we're in this little bubble and it's... Uh, the important thing, however, is bubbles aren't hermetically sealed. You just need a pinprick to, to get through to them. Uh, and frankly, if, uh, if uh, Jacinda Ardern hadn't macro-personalityised on the scene uh, in 2017, the Labour Party, I think, would have finished up somewhere around about 21%, 22%, like a lot of the Social Democrat or ex-socialist parties in Europe finished up. So... Um, the important thing to know about Jacinda Ardern is that she is not stardust, and I got to know her quite well. I was explaining to Dan before that she doesn't like uh, Earl Grey tea, which is a very important point to note for <laughs> having her to tea. Um, uh, she does like uh, she does like single malt whiskey, but that's in a different different matter. She's not super intelligent, but she's certainly inter intelligent enough to do the job and to read the briefs and understand them and ask questions about them proper questions about them. And she has a good intellect as well. Again, it's not super, super, but it's certainly uh, it's an intellect which if she'd bothered to go on in university, she could easily have got a first class honours degree. Uh, and she's tough and she's firm underneath that nice personality. And it is a nice personality. Um, uh, but she's got a solid moral base and a telling off from her hits the mark. And if you want to know, she does all that without being nasty. And if you want to know, Trevor Mallard, who... Uh, one of the more rashed about people, um, got a telling off from her during the campaign uh, back in 2017. He said to me afterwards, that was like, it was far worse than anything I ever got in terms of its effect, and anything I ever got from Helen Clark, and Helen Clark was not a, a softy. So she's got substance. Uh, she is managing a three-way government. It's the first real three-way government that we've had uh, since MMP, and she has insisted to make this thing work that all matters of any significance have to be cleared through the cabinet, cabinet committees, uh, some of them just at the cabinet committee level, but uh, if necessary at the cabinet level. Well, New Zealand First works off a 300-page summary uh, of its policies, which it pulled together uh, for the negotiations back in 2017. So if you want to do anything, uh, if, uh, Tracy Martin's the person who looks after this on New Zealand First. She goes away and looks up the relevant page or pages or bits of this 300-page document to see just where they will, where, how they will negotiate. The Greens have pent up ambitions to um, make the whole planet truly green, uh, but that's in far in excess of their numbers, and they are learning bit by bit. Uh, not all of them. Uh, but they are learning that uh, politics is the art of the possible, uh, as Jack Marshall used to say a long time ago. So you put all those three bits together, getting clearing everything through the Cabinet, uh, New Zealand First needing to go through its 300-page document, and uh, the Greens with their ambitions, uh, and that slowed a lot of the decision-making. When they're 19 months in and uh, still, you know, what have they done except to fix up some things? Uh, they've, it has narrowed the options of his uh, uh, capital gains tax and killed off some of the grand, grander ambitions or postponed them until after the 2020 election. And one minister puts it this way, uh, there's no more new initiatives before the next election. There's just work in progress. Uh, and it's all complicated by the fiscal responsibility rule, which Grant Robertson is determined to stick to. And that's the one that, that the Labor and the Greens agreed with back in 2017. And uh, Jacinda Ardern is not a simple 
chair of the Cabinet. She does from time to time interfere in ministers' portfolios, and not least in foreign affairs. Uh, she doused Winston Peters' enthusiasm for a free trade agreement with Russia, which I thought was a brilliant idea. Um, oh, yeah. Obviously, you guys do too. Oh, sorry. Shouldn't have said it was... Um, and uh, she also, uh, with uh, Vangelis Vitalis' um, assistance, has um, slowed down to a, pretty much a hold a free trade agreement with the United States because if you try and do one with Trump, you may get what you didn't wish for uh, in that he always has to win, as he's demonstrating with China at the moment. And she's also uh, very determined to mollify China as in pushing through the Belt and Road Initiative support. So she can intervene in, in ministers' portfolios and occasionally does. Um, I will mention Grant Robertson because he's really the effective Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, uh, he's a long-term colleague and personal friend of Jacinda Ardern. They're, they're quite close. Uh, and uh, he, Treasury, told me, this is now a year or so ago, that back sort of September, October last year, they were telling me that they thought he had grown into the job. So don't underestimate Grant Robertson's weight in this Cabinet. It's considerable. There's to be a reshuffle in June. Uh, it's rather badly needed because David Parker and uh, Chris Hipkins are way overworked. You can't possibly do what they're supposed to be doing with all their portfolios, but there's a problem in the middle of the cabinet of are the people, real people strong enough to take this over? Um, and I've put some notes, so you can read through the notes if you wish. Uh, I'll, dr I'll single out Andrew Little as handling his portfolios very well. Chris Farfoy, who used to be a journalist, went over to the dark side. Um, uh, I think is handling his portfolios very capably as well. And I think Nanaya Mahuta, who's a person of considerable strength, she doesn't say much, but she's a quiet achiever. Um, in terms of New Zealand First, Tracy Martin, to me, is, is a standout. She understands the portfolios. She's dealing with children and seniors and uh, aspects of education. She has a clear idea where to go. Shane Jones, um, you need very long gumboots near Shane. Uh, deals with his slush fund. <laughs> Um, and, and Winston has emphatic respect, uh, especially in the, no, the South Pacific reset, which I think is not really fully understood, the degree to which the foreign policy is reorienting to the South Pacific, which we've kind of been a paternalistic towards, the recognition that if we don't do that, then China comes in instead. Uh, James Shaw, um, I think he's a bit slow to get real progress on climate change. Uh, uh, he, but he didn't finally get the net zero uh, legislation sort of through and, uh, and he's also been trying to get national list resistant on the methane question. We can talk about that if you wish. I know mean, no reasonable amount about it, having chaired roundtables with the IGPS for 10 years. Julianne Genta has got real influence in transport on the issue of urban form principally. Uh, and if you're going to do transport properly, you do need to consider urban form. And Eugenie Sage is a problem for Labor ministers. Um, who, uh, the real, uh, there's not a lot of, as I've indicated, not a lot of options for Jacinda in the June reshuffle. Uh, but in the second term, I think they've got some people of real ability in the, on the back benches who came in in this last election who could be promoted in a second term. And I've run through the, the names in the, in the notes. Uh, I've noted four policy directions of this government. And I, one is to fix up what it thinks is wrong or has been neglected, and that's principally in health, housing, housing, education, social assistance, workplace relations, regional development, and Labor and New Zealand First agree on that. So do the Greens, really. They disagree on the, the processes, but not on the desirability of it. Um, and I think the sort of adjustments they're making in those areas are not the sort that will really uh, uh, prepare us for the 2020s. OK for the first few years of the 2020s, when we get further down the track and artificial intelligence has changed work quite a bit and changed the way in which businesses operate quite a bit, etc. and there's quite a lot in, in all of that, um, uh, I think they'll, there'll need to be some real work done. The um, Welfare Working Group was... Uh, the response to that was modest, I have to say. Uh, uh, however, um, there is a just transition, uh, and that's to the lower carbon economy. Uh, and um, I was going to say later, but I'll say it now, uh, Jacinda Ardern and uh, Grant Robertson think that can be taken much further and point towards a different 
uh, way on which businesses are organised and jobs are organised in the 2020s. Uh, second dimension is reshaping Māori Crown relations. I don't need to go into that at length. Uh, third dimension is reform of the public service, so that it is a public service, not a state service, and but principally so that you get far more cooperation across agencies, that siloed effect. And I can remember chairing round tables in the Institute of Policy Studies in the mid uh, 1990s uh, of state servants, public servants trying to work out how to break down the silos but still still trying to work that out. But that's principally, that's the principal aim of this change, the, the legislation which was to have come in last year and I think is going to struggle to get get in even this even this um, this year. And it's critical to the success of wellbeing economics and I'll come to that in a second. The fourth generation is the three big ambitions. There's tax reform, uh, well, the, Jacinda Ardern's backed off serious tax reform um, in two senses, not just the capital gains tax, which she's ruled out for, the, for as long as she's leader. I thought, she, I thought logically she would have ruled it out just for the 2020 election, but anyway. But more important, I think, and far more important for you people, uh, is environmental taxes. And the, that's the, it hasn't been given much a space, the tax working groups... Um, uh, work on that, um, but I think that in the 2020s, environmental taxes are the going to be the coming thing. Uh, as you and you shift off income tax and GST onto environmental taxes, deals with externalities, as economists call them. Uh, I think that that um, uh, the basically the, all the answers that the, that the government gave to environmental tax as part of the environment the uh, tax working group was. Consider for inclusion in work program. In other words, sometime maybe. Um, however, uh, don't underestimate the possibility that in a second term government you might get some more action, especially if it's just a Labour Green government on that issue of um, on environmental taxes. Exactly what your guess is good as mine, and it would be just guess. Second is climate change, where you saw the announcement last week. Um, the uh, the resultant legislation is really a framework rather than a program, uh, and I think that only modest steps have so far been taken on uh, what we used to call complementary measures, such as electric vehicles, industrial heat or processing, uh, and heating office blocks and so on. Uh, there's been almost nothing on that so far. Uh, some more is to come on that in renewable energy, and quite soon, I'm told. Uh, and in a second term, I think, Jacinda Ardern might become much more sensitive to these issues, especially if she's just in a majority with just the Greens. And then I mentioned that uh, potential for just transition being extended across into much more of a sort of future of work uh, uh, approach as to uh, um, um, uh, which Grant Robertson did a two-year uh, led a two-year commission, as he called it, on and brought in a lot of people from offshore. And finally, well well-being economics. It sounds pretty fluffy. I started. I took an interest in this when Giro Carajoli, the uh, the Treasury's then the Treasury's chief economist, sent me a draft copy of a paper he'd written on how to operationalise the living standards framework, which I thought was you know, a sort of Pentagon thing that didn't say very much. And I read through the first page and I got to these words, well-being economics, this is the Treasury, quoting a March of Sen. Um, and it's a very different way of thinking about economics. It says that well-being is not just material stuff. It is uh, the state of the natural environment and natural resources and ecosystems. It's the state of, the, of society, social cohesion, uh, and it's the state of human uh, development and uh, and satisfaction, and that's it's a pretty ambitious thing to move uh, from the tightness of that focus on higher GDP, and then we'll do some other things when we've got higher GDP. To these things are all supposed to be uh, on an equal. Now you can't really get very far until you've got numbers, and the numbers are going to take I think five years or so uh, from now. But it is quite the uh, Treasury got quite determined about it. Uh, before the election, or rather Gabs Markleuf, the departing secretary of the Treasury did, and some of his people, gradually growing number, um, and, um, and Grant Robertson and Jacinda Ardern figured out there was a real opportunity to do something different. So 2019 budget on the 30th is the first wellbeing budget. Um, it'll be fascinating to see how it's presented. Where it 
uh, provided the, the current government stays in office or the current Labour-led government, sta Labour stays in office leading governments, I'll put it that way, uh, for the next, for at least one more term, I think that we're, we're going to have well-being stay with us. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. The important thing to remember is that it has descended from Bill English's social investment. This is not something or from a way out left field. This is something that Bill English built up, this notion of investing so that you've got a return on your investment in people who are more able to contribute to society, etc. Uh, and it's definitely going to require far more cross-portfolio operation from, minute, from departments than they've remotely been capable of up until now. Well, near the finish, who governs after next election? Um, one factor is national, um, with the exception, in my view, of Nikki Kay in education, who really is trying to think ahead, and, uh, and Scott Simpson, who's trying to think ahead also on environmental issues. I think national has scarcely moved from its positioning, which is essentially upholding the uh, 1980s orthodoxy, adopted, ad adjusted a bit by the third way under Helen Clark and adjusted a bit more under uh, Bill English and John Key. Um, and its problem is uh, it doesn't have a partner. Its best hope would be if somehow Greens and New Zealand First both went out of office, both went out of Parliament, but had quite a got four percent or so. There was a large wasted vote, uh, and uh, National just got a few more votes than than Labor and becomes the government. So you can't rule it out, but I think all of that's rather uh, is not uh, all that convincing. And uh, Simon uh, Bridges. Uh, uh, I think has yet to stamp his himself on his leadership. I put a bit of time into Simon when he first came in, thinking he had real promise, and then I watched him as uh, as minister, not really performing to the promise I thought he had, uh, and I, I think he still hasn't as leader. But you know, we're still 16 months away from the next election. I think the Greens will clear five percent. I should perhaps change that to should. They've got money, and they've got a lot of energy. Uh, they didn't have uh, 10 years ago. Uh, they've got a lot more nous about how politics operates as well. New Zealand First may struggle to get across 5%, not least because uh, it's 7% last time, 5% of that 7%, 5 percentage points of that 7%, uh, actually uh, wanted them to go with Labour and the other two with Nationals. So they really start off at 5%, so they've got very little leeway to lose. So much depends on, on how well they can carry that regional development policy off and how well uh, um, Shane Jones uh, carry, continues, <laughs> um, especially if he want, upsets people. He's a great pity, actually. I thought Shane's got, he's a very intelligent guy. Um, he's very personable. Uh, and if I went back 10 years, I, I would have been saying to you, I think he's someone to watch, that he could go all the way to the top. If there's a Labour-led government uh, in the second term, there are four possible combinations. The Labour plus New Zealand First plus Greens with New Zealand First in second place, as now, you know, continuation. Uh, then, then there's Labour plus Greens plus New Zealand First with Greens in second place, but still all three needed for a majority. So not a lot changes again, uh, although Winston Peters couldn't stay as Deputy Prime Minister uh, uh, and would probably have, Sir Winston would probably have to go to London uh, or somewhere. Um, <laughs> and then, then Labor, Labor and Greens have a majority on their own, but Jacinda Ardern keeps New, New Zealand first, gets over 5%, and Jacinda Ardern says, I want, just like John Key did, I want to keep all three parties in the coalition. Uh, and uh, Labour plus Greens have a majority and New Zealand First goes out. You can decide which one, which uh, scenario you think is the most likely. It's uh, 16 months to go and it's far too early to be refining it. Um, the option, a, the option uh, a second term gives this government is to, de is to decide whether it does want to be transformative instead of just reforming. Because uh, so far it's looked much more like a reforming government, uh, particularly fixing up things, and climate change, well-being, economics taking a, some distance, but not. <coughs> uh, but uh, who knows? They might they might decide they want to be uh, a government of transformation in a second term if they get a second term. Thank you. Now we've got uh, we've got a chance for just maybe one question before we need to carry on. Yeah.
to bring it. Oh, Mike. You presume it's one party, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and, and we presume that it's, it's automatically going to attach itself to, to uh, a Labour vote. Um, and the reality is in our society now, there is a lot of, say, national centre-right voters who are very aware of Green and have got uh, quite a lot of opinions on it, but they obviously see the Green Party is, is, is far too left-wing or the, the welfare wing of it, so they never vote. But if that party became more centre, you might say, and concentrated more on the um, environmental side... Do you think there is any chance that, you know, you talk about there's never going to be a Green um, National Coalition, but if that party changed, that that sort of was, was possible if, in the um, future? Yeah. Uh, back in 1996, there was a small party called the Pro Progressive Greens, I think they called themselves, which was on the national side of politics. And the likes of Guy Salmon and, and people like that um, are definitely on that sort of side. Uh, I, I could see if... I can construct circumstances in which I could see James Shaw working with National and I and I could see uh, Julianne Genter working with National, but they're certainly not going to try to take their party across uh, because their party would disappear from them underneath their feet. Now, now that then asks the question of whether there can be a different party and uh, Kennedy Graham, who was... Um, who leans sort of National Woods rather than Labour Woods anyway and no longer in Parliament. Uh, very smart guy, Kennedy. Um, he he's very he he's very hopeful that the sustainability party might get up enough uh, to at some point be able to form a, a, a sort of green um, uh, adjunct with the national party, and there's a basis for it as well within the national party or attached to the national party, and that's the blue green uh, ginger group, and I've been to quite a number of their forums, not the last two, but. Um, they are definitely green, but they are blue-green. And the option for National is to develop a blue-green uh, um, alternative to the red-green. Uh, and that option, National, has not really taken up yet. And I, I had thought that the blue-greens would have been much more vigorous already in, in opposition than they have been. But you're quite right. Green is not the uh, um, property of the left. Green is green. And it can certainly work. As if Roger Scruton wrote an excellent book, I think, on uh, conservative green uh, policy. Uh, he's a British philosopher um, about ten years ago. So, yeah, if I if we were sitting here five five years time, it might be quite interesting what my response to your suggestion might be as to what's evolved in the meantime. Uh, but it, if it would help, I think that green movement to build if it had more support, more overt support from people who are saying, we really want this to be alongside national. Not one. 